there is seldom a Mexican standoff in battle. You either win or lose. And in many fights, a commander reaches a point where he thinks he's lost. He sees only his losses and knows only his own situation, not the enemy's. The carnage surrounding him erodes his confidence. Wellington at Waterloo thought he'd lost. So did Easy Company under Desiderio in the fight on the hill up north. Grant summed up the feeling best at Fort Donelson during the Civil War. Either side was ready to give way if the other showed a bold front. Well, we'd certainly shown a bold front, but so had the men from China. Neary appeared again, this time carrying an unconscious little Chinese man. I found out later that after I'd told him we needed a prisoner, he'd taken it as a personal assignment. He'd charged up the hill and stormed the top unarmed. Once in the enemy position, he'd smashed this Chinese on the head with his fist and hot-footed it back to me. Unfortunately, the POW died before we got the skinny. He'd kept trying to pull one of the grenades off Neary's belt on the way back, and Neary had stomped him obviously a little too hard. So we got another prisoner. But then, just when we needed him most, our interpreter, Kim Upsu, decided to bug out. Speed saw him running down the hill. He stopped him. I go, I go, said Kim, and edged away. Jack didn't know what to do. He was good and ready to waste him. Instead, he leveled his weapon and shot off Kim's hand. This persuasive little tactic worked, and as we bandaged him up, Kim decided he liked our company after all. The word from the POW was just what we wanted to hear. Our artillery had clobbered the enemy reinforcing unit. Intelligence had been off by about 300 men in terms of enemy strength on Hill 400. The Chinese were reinforcing through a tunnel trench network on the reverse slope, which ran through to Hill 419 behind, and no one on the hill had any fight left in him. I told Jimmy and the others to round up every gun that could walk, limp, or crawl. We were going to storm the top. Twenty bloodied and battered raiders soon crested the hill. Its surface was covered with enemy dead. The Chinese defenders who hadn't been killed on position had chanced running the gauntlet of artillery shot, which continued to blast the back of the hill. Judging from the carnage on the reverse slope, few had made it. But an intact Bren gun crew was still raising hell among our tired band. There were more casualties, until Jimmy and Evans went on the attack. They killed the crew but paid the price. Jimmy lay like a broken reed next to the gun. He'd taken a shot in the face that ripped through his right eye and lower jaw. Evans lay nearby, staring at Jimmy with wide, lifeless eyes and a satisfied look on his heavily mustached face. It was the look of a winner. He'd probably just said to Jimmy, Well, we got the son of a bitch, before a burst of enemy fire, most likely the last of the fight, hit him full in the chest and ripped the life out of him. Neary switched on his radio to report the capture of Hill 400. Relief was en route, he was told, dispatched by a worried Colonel Sloan when we went off the air. Oh, say, can you see, I thought, as in the dull light of morning we collected our scattered and broken fighters from the blood-soaked American-held hill. The inexhaustible brakeman was kneeling over Jim Mee, pumping life into him with a container of albumin. Some piece of cake, we had seven KIA, 29 WIA, and one Raider Salazar missing. The only two Raiders who were not hit were Lipka and Sovereign, the two gunners. Their machine guns had been out of range of the frags that had depleted our ranks. It was a strange turnabout. Normally the gunners ride in the death seat. We turned the hill over to the relieving wolfhound unit and continued looking for Salazar. We wouldn't leave the hill without him, and any man who could walk joined in the search. He'd been patched up after he and Smith had knocked out the machine gun, but no one had seen him since he'd returned to the fight. A faint moan was heard in a draw on the steep left-hand side of 400. It was Salazar, more dead than alive. He'd been blown off the hill by a grenade, and somehow, with twenty-nine slugs or shrapnel wounds in his body, that tough Texan hombre was still sucking in air. The doc got some blood into him, and we started down the hill. We carried all our dead and the wounded who could not make it under their own steam. Speed and I brought Jimmy's broken body down in a poncho while Brakeman kept the album and going. Regimental medics took over and carried the litter cases down by stretcher. There had been no free rides on that terrible hill. Chris's boy Johnny bled, too, as he accompanied Chris through the low-lying fog. Mortar fire continued to smash in around us, but it was ignored by all. After what we'd been through, it didn't mean a thing. Colonel Sloan had walked alone to meet us on Hill 400's forward slopes. He, too, ignored the incoming as he went from raider to raider, helping, comforting, praising.
Tears streamed from his eyes in that early morning light as he helped us down. He led us to the aid station, and there I saw seven figures all lined up, each covered with a poncho. It's just a nightmare, thought, but I didn't believe myself at all. I went to each body and pulled the sheet back off the face. One by one I cradled those men and rocked them in my arms, crying and mumbling and damning God because he had let me down. Now that the curtain had fallen, the shock of it all came on. Suddenly I felt empty, every part of me ached. My mouth was dry as the beach full of sand. Sloan helped me to my feet. He was a fine, caring man and a great commander. A medic came up, looked at my wounds, and hit me with another siret of morphine. It dulled the pain, but not enough. He told me to lie down in a litter so I could be evacuated, but I was not about to go anywhere. The welfare of my men was not a responsibility that could be delegated. Until everyone had been cared for, I'd stay right there. I walked into the small tent that had been set up to act as a temporary surgery. Jimmy was on the table. He was bad, ashen white, almost no blood pressure, and little sign of breathing. He was about to check out. The medical officer could not get blood into him. He kept saying that Jimmy had lost too much, that all his veins were deflated. But Doc Brakeman had gotten a needle into Jimmy's arm up there on top of the hill in the dark, and he was being shot at. I couldn't understand why this surgeon was jabbing everywhere but where it counted. Then I realized he was drunk, or that he'd been on a big binge the night before. He smelled like a barroom rag, and his hands were shaking as he frantically stabbed that needle into Jimmy's arm. I pulled my pistol out and put it against his head. Man, if you don't get that thing in the next time, you're one dead doctor. The needle went in next round, and the grim death mask Jimmy wore slowly began to fade. Steady, brave Doc Brakeman gently led me outside the tent. He said everyone was fine, and he wanted me to rest on a stretcher. Combat medics are mountains of courage and wisdom. Brakeman stood out as the ultimate among these fine men. I lay down. The shot was taking effect. I was so sleepy. There were faces. Colonel Sloan, Major Stambaugh, Dell Evans from 2D Bat, and then Phil Gilchrist who'd come the whole way down from Division forward to lend a hand to his old George and Easy buddies, then was being lifted and swung in the air, and then a motor and hard bumps like knives, sending sharp pains throughout my body. And God hadn't yet explained why he'd forgotten us. I woke up thinking I was in the raider camp. Eyes closed, familiar voices were all around, laughing, chatting, talking about 400, talking about the fight. The fight. I opened my eyes. I was in a long tent ward at a mash. The bed next to mine was occupied by Chris, and then as far as I could see were raiders, carrying on as though they were at a Boy Scout jamboree. Turned to Chris. What is the status of the unit, Master Sergeant Crispino? Raiders, listen up! Chris shouted down the row of beds, and the roll call began. Beezy, Denny, Evans, Hearn, the wounded and the dead, all present and accounted for. Jimmy and Jack fell into the heading of accounted for. Neither was in our wing. They were down in intensive care. Chris cornered a medic and asked him for a status report on our friends. They're in a bad way, the medic said flippantly upon his return. I wouldn't take any bets on their making it. Chris lashed out. You better watch your mouth and get some respect, goddamn, or I'll get out of this bed and kick your ass all over this tent. Chris was always so diplomatic. But if he hadn't said it, one of us would have. It was not because of the news the medic brought. Something like it had been in the cards for months. But they were cards we'd dealt. Yes, we'd lived on the edge of death. Yes, we'd made the choice to gamble recklessly with our young lives. The only thing that could not be replaced. But who was this rear echelon callous bastard to see our fate, and the fate of all his charges, as potential stakes in his own floating crap game? Where are they? Chris snapped. A contrite and more than a little worried medic gave him the layout of the mash. We found Speed first. He was as white as his sheet and filled with tubes. His belly was swollen and painted a bright, ugly orange color. His spleen had been removed. He'd lost a massive amount of blood, and there was a good chance of infection. But Jack was a gambler. He dug the challenge of long odds, and I knew he was going to make it. He was talking now and in my mind's eye he was already sitting on the edge of my bed in the morning with a bottle of Jack Daniels. Now, son, he'd be saying in that slow Tennessee drawl, 
Take a slug of this, cause I'm about to tell you the goddamnedest story about a lethal heel called 400. Except for his mouth and one eye, Jimmy's face and head were completely covered in bandages. So was the rest of his body. In addition to any other wounds, it seemed that a grenade must have exploded on top of him and filled him with shrapnel. He lapsed in and out of consciousness, he twisted and tried to turn and muttered in Japanese. Chris and I tried to talk to him, but he was far away. We talked to him anyway, and somehow our voices brought him back for a moment. The Chinese, he said. Heavens, get down. Then he came off 400 and moved back in time. I got pineapple, man. Poor crushed Jimmy was back with Easy, where the practice was to carry your sea ration cans inside your fatigue jacket over your belly. Fruit was a sea ration prize. It could slow or stop a slug with the best of them and tasted far better than most. Jimmy, I said. Then I stopped. What do you say to your friend when he's dying? I loved him. I wanted him to make it. I wanted him to fight harder. Maybe if we could bring him around, he'd zero in and concentrate on staying alive. Jimmy, I said, you're a sergeant. A sergeant first class. His good eye fluttered and slowly opened. He seemed to focus in on me for a second. Ah, damn, man. Why'd you do that? Then he slipped back into his deep, dark coma. A gentle nurse chased us back to our beds, assuring us that Jimmy looked far worse off than he really was. She said he was getting stronger, and that, in fact, it was Jack who was not out of the woods. Over the next few days, one, two, and three at a time, medics wheeled us into surgery. If you don't make it, I'll have your watch. Ooh. If you don't make it, I'll be on top of your woman before you hit the slab. The same great raider spirit followed Chris and me as we went down that long hall together. The injected pre-op cocktail had stung, but it took away most of the pain and some of the fright. An arm that was somehow familiar was strapped to a board under the watchful eyes of masked people in green clothes. A glaring spotlight beamed overhead. It seemed even brighter with the second needle, as if someone had brought the sun inside. A gloved hand holding a forceps skillfully probed around the ripped flesh of the restrained arm. The instrument went in empty and came out holding shards of steel. Like pulling a rabbit out of a hat, I thought. A scalpel went in next and carved a donut around the jagged hole. Debridement, it's called. I found out later. The chunk of meat was extracted. The gloved hand balanced it deftly on the end of the scalpel. With a flip of the wrist, the meat sailed through the air into a bucket of blood and other discarded chunks of damaged government property. They should empty that thing, I thought, as blood slopped out of the brimming pail and slowly dripped down the white surgery wall. A voice behind a green mask said there were no complications and to leave it open to drain. Lieutenant Hackworth, the same voice said, do you want the shrapnel as a souvenir? I climbed back through the looking glass. The arm was my arm, the bucket held my blood. And Jimmy's and Jack's and all that flowed down 400. And now this man with gloved hands was asking me if I wanted a souvenir. As if I were a tourist. As if in my old age I'd want something, need something to remind me of that terrible hill, this stinking tent hospital, all the wounded and all the dead. It tried to tell the skillful hand what he could do with his little souvenir, and for that matter the whole war when another gloved hand administered another needle and I drifted away. They cleaned up my chest, but I didn't watch. I awoke next on a hospital train. I'd come this way in the summertime, and now it was cold. My semi-annual vacation south. Hey, Mr. Conductor, thought, let me off at Taijun. My friend lives there by the railroad track. And then I fell back into a heavy, drugged sleep. We were unloaded at the Pusan train station. I asked the medic to put my litter next to that of Raider Charles Beasy who'd lost his right hand on 400. Beasy was from a farming family in Indiana. He'd been destined to take over the business, and now he was worrying how he'd manage. He was down, really down. I'd kind of been looking forward to the old officer's ward, but it didn't seem like a good time to leave him alone. Not As the medic sorted through the sea of litters on the platform, Meshkai disappeared my medical tag. A sergeant assigned Beasy to the Swedish hospital. Then he knelt by my litter. Where's your tag? Don't know, I said. Just woke up. He said he'd make me a new one. I told him I was Sergeant Hackworth and gave him my old enlisted serial number. Can I go with my friend? Sure, he replied. 
and Beezy and I rode off in an ambulance, side by side. I fell off again and awoke with an Ingrid Bergman look-alike in Hospital White standing over me. Who stole the tea? she asked, or at least that's what it sounded like. I just got here, I thought. Haven't been here long enough to steal anything. She wanted to know my name and where my medical card was. I told her I was a wolfhound raider, which for some reason she thought was quite funny. And then I went through my Sergeant U.S. Army EM serial number routine while a grateful Beezy in the next bed bit his lip to keep from laughing. I thought of my brother Roy in L.A., who was now on a first-name basis with Western Union. This would be the fourth telegram. The Secretary of the Army has asked me to express his deep regret that your brother Shet Hackworth David H. was seriously wounded in action. And I hoped he wouldn't read it carefully. Last round I'd been a lieutenant. I knew Roy would handle the wound part, but I wasn't sure about the bust. On the other hand, having a brother who's a sergeant was probably better than one who was an inmate at San Quentin, which as kids is where I'm sure he thought I'd end up. Beezy was still down. I tried to cheer him up with stories about my father, who had lost most of his right hand in a mining accident in Colorado, but from everything I'd heard, he'd managed quite well. Besides, I said, the VA would give him a special tractor each year and plow his South 40 on request. He'd find a blue VA check on the first of every month, and really, I told him. He had it made. A grateful America would never forget him. The patter didn't help much. Beezy's good fortune would only hit home when he started to look at the other wounds on our ward. Down a few beds, the kid with no legs and only a little stump for an arm. Across from him, a guy whose guts were sitting outside his stomach. Next to him, a Chinese soldier who'd lost both forearms. The Chinese boy had been brought in by two tall, chrome-plated MPs. They dropped his litter a foot from the floor. I guess they thought we'd be pleased, but we'd booed, cursed, and hissed them out of the room. Had there been a gun around, someone would have shot them. There was no enemy on our ward. Hospital clothes had no patches or flags. Away from the battlefield, there was instead an unspoken bond. Camaraderie based not on a uniform, but in a barely hatched notion we shared. That one and all, we were just battered pawns in a larger game that had nothing to do with us at all. But after lights out, the game went on. Boys in their sleep fought battles over and over again. Our moans, often tortured screams, punctuated each other's dreams. A horrific, endless war movie, playing on through the night. I spent my 21st birthday in the Swedish hospital one week to the day after Hill 400. My birthday present was a rash. The worst rash, I thought, ever experienced in the history of mankind. I scratched myself to pieces, the rash got worse. Few of the doctors and nurses spoke English, so even if I'd known, I couldn't have explained what was wrong. They thought it was from the antibiotics, so they changed them. That didn't help. So when I started to scratch until I bled, they tied my hands and feet to the bed. Modern Medicine I wiggled and squirmed night and day until finally an American doctor stopped by for his weekly visit. Man, I'm dying, I told him. I'm going crazy. Hill 400, I thought. It'll never go away. I must have picked them up crawling through enemy positions. Mao Zedong's revenge. The nurses trundled me off into the shower, and then they bathed a sheet in calamine or some such lotion and wrapped me up in it. Joy. The civilian doctor in charge at the hospital had told me my arm and chest were healing well. On the fourth day there, Fortunately, before the lice reared their itchy little heads, the drain was pulled and I was stitched up with wire. After my short glimpse of heaven in a pink sheet, the American doctor returned to tell me they'd take the stitches out in the morning. But then he dropped the bomb. He said he wasn't sure I'd ever be able to straighten my arm again. I'd lost too much bicep muscle and so much flesh. Now it was my turn to worry. Much as I joked with Beezy, there was nothing too glorious about being a 21-year-old cripple. When the doctor was two beds down, I flopped out of mine, went to the floor, and did a push-up. It hurt like hell, but I straightened my arm until the elbow locked. The doctor and his assistants came running up, thinking I'd fallen out of bed. I told them I hadn't fallen, I'd rolled, and that if I was going to have a stiff arm for the rest of my life, no way was it going to be hanging there like a crab claw. A dozen or so stitches had ripped out, but I didn't care. My goddamn arm was parade ground straight. Beezy was shipped to Japan, and from there he'd go stateside. My own wound was still raw and leaking fluid. The word was I'd be discharged in a few weeks. I was getting regular mail from the raider camp and had an idea what was happening. Light wounds were drifting back. The unit had been reformed, 
Lieutenant John Arvidson, a gung-ho Californian who'd participated in the 1948 Mideast War, had been assigned as new skipper and he'd filled the raiders up. But he did not seem to have an eye for quality or was being rushed by the higher-ups. The outfit seemed full of guys we'd rejected. It didn't matter now that Chris was back and that the lieutenant and R.T. O'Neary had gotten shot up helping out a George Company operation on 400. That jinxed Hill, which totally beyond my belief, had been abandoned soon after the raiders took it. Now there was talk that we might be disbanded. Raids had been canceled, Chris was going to see Colonel Sloan, and when was I coming home? I was bored without Beasy and had no reason to stay in this hospital. I figured Doc Brakeman could look after my arm, and besides, it was somehow discovered that I was an officer impersonating an NCO, and all along had been the ringleader of much of the havoc on the ward. They told me that if I didn't shape myself up, they'd ship me right out to an officer's ward. But I didn't want to go to another ward, officers or not. I wanted to go back to the Raiders. So I got myself some gear and said goodbye to my wardmates and lovely nurse Bergman. I caught a midnight train back to Seoul and hitchhiked up to our camp. A truck driver let me off on the MSR. I ran down the little side road. It was cold, but I was too excited to notice. The Raider camp was covered in snow. Our flag was gone, skull and crossed bones replaced by the stars and stripes, which flapped majestically in the wind. Newly whitewashed rocks in perfect formation around the camp made our renegade outfit look like the 25th Quartermaster Company, but I didn't care. Smoking stovepipe said someone was home, and so was I. I ran past the raider gate and burst through the tent flaps of the mess. The guys around the stove jumped up, and in an instant the old raiders were all over me like a welcome rash. One and all, they tried their best to break my back with giant bear hugs. Our yelling and carrying on brought everyone else to the tent, and it was more of the same. The new guys in the outfit stood on the outside looking in. So this is Hackworth, their express scion seemed to say. God, it was good to be back. Chris limped in. What the hell took you so long, he said, but his hug was that of a long-lost brother. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Then we caught up. Each raider was accounted for, including Jimmy and Jack. They'd made it. Chris had checked with the nurse before he left MASH. Both were strong and would soon be shipped to Japan. We unlimbered some well-stashed hooch and the reunion got serious, just like the old days. The new guys drifted out as unwelcome as an ex-husband at his former wife's wedding reception. This homecoming party. Ish was exclusive to the Brotherhood of 400. We refought the battle, and as the story unraveled, we knew it had been one mean, bloody fight. But what the hell? We'd won. We'd kicked their stinking asses. And as the booze flowed, our glorious achievements and heroic acts became even more so. No one got sentimental or teary, but no one pulled out the Raider photo either, the one we'd had taken with all of us in all our gear, which by SOP after previous raids we'd laughingly update by crossing out the faces of our lucky comrades evacuated because of wounds. And no one talked about the dead. There was no way we could understand why they had died and we had lived, so we just pretended they had not gone. It was the only way. The pain would otherwise have been too great, the loss too traumatic. So they were as alive to us as they'd been in the battle, and any moment now they too would come bursting through that tent flap and join in the fun. Next came the ritual parade of scars. Everyone bared their wounds. Favorites, of course, were the ones that could be seen on the beach. When I was a kid, I'd had death before dishonor tattooed on my arm. The shrapnel that had ripped right through it on 400 made me candidate for Mr. American Legion. But the booby prize went to one poor hero who had a long, wicked, red-stitched welt across one cheek of his ass. It wasn't at all good beach material to prove he'd been gored by a fierce Chinese bull. But what's with the white rocks, I asked, and where is the raider flag and Bobby and the girls? There's been a lot of house cleaning. Think someone figured we'd fight better if we were strictly G.I., replied a drunken raider. It didn't sound promising to me. I shot Chris a glance. He nodded. We'd have to take a long jeep ride. Colonel Sloan hadn't thought he'd see me back. One couldn't get rid of me that easily. He said I was wrong. He was sending me home. He thought I should go to the infantry school and get some formal military education. That I'd used up all my chances on the battlefield. Reminded him, had not seen combat compared to those guys who had fought through Africa and Europe or during that long island-hopping campaign in the Pacific.
but the colonel who'd fought in both theaters would not be moved. What about the raiders? I asked. Sloan wasn't sure. He hadn't been able to find the right man for a raider leader. He needed a fighter, and apparently they were becoming a rare breed. I suggested he commission Crispino, who knew the score better than anyone. Sloan said he'd think about it, and in the meantime, I was to shape the raiders up. They'd go on operations with Chris as the skipper while I, banished from the front line, conducted training and played liaison officer between them and Sloan. Yes, sir. As I was leaving, I was stopped by the regimental adjutant. Colonel Sloan, he said, had directed that every deserving raider be decorated for the operation on 400. The adjutant had tried to get it moving while I was in the I told him he hospital, but the few remaining NCOs wouldn't help. It was as though there was some conspiracy not to put in for any decorations. Good men, my raiders. Back in August, when we'd formed the unit, the NCOs and I had decided not to play the medals game. It was honor enough, we thought, just to be a raider. About decorations, Napoleon had said, Some people call them baubles. Well, it is by such baubles that one leads men. But in our judgment, the raider tab the guys wore over their 25th division patch was just as good, maybe even better. And besides, we did not want the raiders to become a watering hole for glory hunters. Hill 400 wasn't the first time I'd been asked to get recommendations together. Always in the past, I'd say, we're working on them and let it go until the fast turnover of combat clerks through rotation made the boys at the top lose track. Now I told the adjutant about our policy. He said it wouldn't wash, but that he'd provide specialists from his awards section to facilitate the paperwork. It was time to rebuild the raiders. I sent most of the new replacements packing and started recruiting all over again. But few people wanted to join up these days. It wasn't like last August, when we had a line a mile long waiting outside the raider camp. Still, we managed to scratch together a unit and immediately started to train. But none of the old guys really had their hearts in it anymore, and neither did I. The awards team came down, they stayed with us, interviewed the guys, and then typed up all the necessary supporting papers. It was a snap. All we had to do was tell a few war stories and sign our names. Bill Smith was put in for the Medal of Honor and Jimmy, Chris, and Jack Speed went in for the DSC. All the rest were for Silver Stars. Then, at Division, a few of these recommendations were knocked down to the next lower awards. To me, that was wrong. Like James Aguda's Medal of Honor being knocked back to a Silver Star was wrong. It was only much later that I realized my own idealistic policy regarding decorations for the Raiders had been wrong, too. For myself, especially after Aguda, decorations had lost most of their meaning. But for the others... My prejudice meant that so many deserving fighters would grow old with nothing to show for their extraordinary gallantry with the Raiders. Or just one tin medal for the last hurrah. They should have had one for every damn time they suited up. There were a few more raids with Chris as leader, but everyone was jittery. Sometimes the words were spoken, sometimes they were not. But no one wanted another 400. A week before Christmas, Jimmy's sister wrote to ask for the circumstances of his death. His death. I refused to believe it. None of us would. We got knee-knocking drunk and argued about it until midnight, at which point Chris and I and two other guys decided to go to the horse's mouth. We drove by open jeep in a bitching snowstorm, a sobering experience itself, to get to the mash where we'd last seen him. We woke up the duck. He remembered our mass unit visit but could not recall Jimmy. He pulled all the records, and starting from 4 to November he worked forward through the papers. When he hit the 8th, I could tell by his face before he spoke that our brother was gone. Strong, soon on the way to Japan, Jimmy Mayamura had died on the operating table. They'd gone in to take his liver of shrapnel out of his brain. When it was pulled, his clock had stopped running. The news about Jimmy was the death knell for the Raiders. It would have been, even if Sloan had commissioned Crispino, but even that was impossible because some thorough clerk had not disappeared the paperwork from Chris's court-martial over the hot jeep, and a guy couldn't be commissioned if he'd had trouble with the law. And although years later Colonel Sloan would say of his decision to disband the Raiders, even though they were volunteers and they'd volunteered for this specific sort of thing, I didn't think it was reasonable for these people to carry the combat load for the whole regiment. Among ourselves we knew there was still another reason. The Raiders were burned out. We were all used up, 
We turned in our gear and folded up our tents to the strains of Chris's favorite campfire tune, That Old Gang of Mine. It was the saddest duty I had ever performed. Colonel Sloan organized good jobs for those not eligible for rotation. Not on the battlefield, though. Putting a raider in the trenches would be like locking up a panther in the East Podunk Zoo. We exchanged permanent addresses and swore we'd keep in touch, maybe even have a reunion every ten years or so. Chris still had another year and a half on his hitch. He didn't know where he was to be assigned back in the States, so he gave me his mother's address in Connecticut. We made a pact. If either of us was crazy enough to come back to Korea, we'd grab the other and take him along. Just as I was about to leave for the division's replacement depot, Repo Depot, to start out processing, I was again hospitalized and evacuated to Pusan. My arm was wildly infected. Another operation revealed that the souvenir tooting dock had left a large chunk of steel in there. This time they cut in from the other side and cleaned it out properly. Too bad the boys won't get to see this, I thought, because along with the old scar, it was a humdinger. By the time I got out of the hospital, the wolfhounds had been shifted from the front lines to the small island of Koji, off the southern tip of Korea. I couldn't imagine why the best regiment in Korea had been pulled off the line and sent back to this place. Rumors were flying in every direction. The wolfhounds were returning to the States to lead some parade down Pennsylvania Avenue, the regiment was to be trained in amphibious operations for another invasion of North Korea. I got the real story before we tied up at the docks. It seemed that Koje had become a huge stockade for enemy POWs. Of late, the little mothers had been rioting, embarrassing Uncle Sam and disrupting the peace talks. The wolfhounds were there to bring order, not one to miss a good firefight. Even Jack Speed was back for the battle in Compound 62 a bloody affair that saw one wolfhound killed by a friendly fire at the height of the madness. But all these happenings didn't matter much to me. The wolfhounds had changed so much that besides the surviving raiders scattered throughout the regiment, I hardly knew any of the people. Friends from 50 and 51 were long gone. I'd be there only long enough to have my points tallied up and get processed to go home. I checked in and was assigned a cot in the regimental transient officer's tent. That night I sacked out and had a wild nightmare. The Chinese were yelling and screaming in a mass attack. We were surrounded. I forced myself awake inside that dark, unfamiliar tent, scared witless with cold sweat dripping down. But the dream wouldn't go away. The screaming continued. I pulled up a corner of the tent and peered into the early morning half-light. There were thousands of Chinese out there on the road right next to my tent, all in formation, running, singing, and counting cadence like sheep. But I was safe. Wolfhounds with fixed bayonets were shepherding them along. Strangely, the POWs were wearing brand new U.S. Army officers' gear, pinks and greens, the current classy officers' dress uniform, as well as Ike jackets, OD trousers, and World War II officers' greens. But on the back of each was neatly stenciled POW. Apparently, the U.S. Army quartermaster had found these surplus uniforms unsuitable, either through obsolescence or slight wear and tear. Most of the wolfhounds were picking the eyes out of the best stuff and sending it home. If you can't beat them, join them, I thought, as I headed over to the POW Supply Center later in the morning to get a complete and free issue of new officer's gear myself. Jack Sprinkler had gotten the top X Raider job. He roamed around the island with ease as a driver secretary for the regimental Red Cross man, Charles Delmonico. We got together my first day there and had a few drinks from Mr. D's bountiful Red Cross grog larder. As the drinking went on, I commented on the island beauties I'd been noticing. Jack informed me solemnly that girls were off-limits. What else is new, I thought. Girls are always off-limits. But as Jack went on, the Army's policy against fraternization suddenly became most appealing. It turned out that before it became a POW camp, the island of Koje had been a leper colony. Kinda makes you lose your interest. We decided on the next best thing. Jack put the word out, and all former raiders on the island got together the afternoon before I was to leave. We had to meet at the NCO club, so I plucked off my insignia. The Army's fraternization rules dealt not only with the opposite sex, but also between officers and enlisted. In other words, it was okay for an EM to die in your arms, but most unbecoming for you to drink with one in his club. It was the first time we'd partied together outside the raider camp. We pushed tables together and covered their tops end to end with the only thing going, whiskey and coke. 
So many faces were missing, but we still had a merry time, fueled by the booze, the war stories, and our love and respect for each other, until some sergeant from one of the battalions recognized my face. Hey, you're a lieutenant, Hackworth. From the Raiders. What are you doing in our club? The sergeant started to heavy me, but then my boys stood up, and by the end of the brawl, about the only thing left of the NCO club was the concrete floor and roof. The Raiders may have been low on numbers, and it was certainly not our most professional fight, but there was no doubt at all that we'd won. The following morning, hung over and with a bashed-up face, I packed my bags. The boys saw me off at the coastal steamer that would take me to Pusan, then Sasebo, Japan, and then home. And as I looked at all the black eyes and split lips around me, I knew the NCO club incident was the only fitting end for the Raiders. We'd been born in battle, and that's how we finished up, too.